Uh, it's a great question. And in fact, um, at the beginning of the campaign, if you remember the first two weeks of this federal election, it was boring. <laughs> Nothing was happening. It was like um, uh, pulling teeth, knocking on doors. Nobody was engaged in this election. Um, then Rick Mercer came out with his little thing, right? And I started having high hopes for a higher youth turnout in Canada. There was so much engagement. There were flash mobs, there were lip dubs, there were blogs happening, there were a lot of uh, youth groups who were not normally politically active suddenly getting engaged on Twitter especially. You saw a lot of youth people, especially in the Green Party, starting to get engaged and, and um, there was uh, youthvote.ca, a nonpartisan group, which came up. So I looked at that in the last three weeks of the campaign, and I was going, you know, maybe, just maybe, more than 32% of the under 25s would come out. If we could raise that by 10%, I'd have, you know, I'd just go, that's a victory. That's fantastic. You know what? It didn't happen. In fact, the overall youth vote went down by 0.5% compared to the last election. And that's sad. And I agree with Janai. I think that there's something in there which says youth uh, at a certain age, especially I would say university students, right, engage with pol politics and policy in a different way. It, for them, it's not about the vote. Maybe it's more about a different way of connecting with politicians and having an effect on politics. We heard that the reverse was true with the Obama first election, that the, the youth vote was out there due to social media, especially with the donations. Can you comment, uh, any knowledge on that side? Yeah, but one of the things with that is it's four years of campaigning, right? You know, the person wins and people start going to Iowa and New Hampshire. And so we had how many weeks? Five weeks? Five weeks, yeah. That's not enough to um, build the foundation for um, something similar to MyBarackObama.com. So they had years um, to do that, yeah. right? And I know that the fundraising for the Barack Obama 2012 campaign um, is really um, starting in full force. I mean, I must have had a request every day, I mean, emails from Michelle or Barack, yeah, you're getting them too. Um, and phone calls from Democrats abroad. Oh, I just outed myself. Yes, I'm a Democrat. You're <laughs> I know, you're sh completely shocked, right? What is it, your wife? I teach gender, do these other things. My last name is Aragon. What are the chances that I would be a Democrat, right? Yeah, because my, my people vote Democrat prim um, primarily. Um, so I think part of it is that we didn't have the enough time and speaking to the poor numbers, the election was taking place during university finals, and when many of them were done and going. Uh, I'll just very quickly say is that, um, you know, in the United States, uh, I mean, the amount I think one congressional candidate has to fundraise and spend is the equivalent of, you know, every federal political party in Canada. Uh, I mean, it's just several orders of magnitude larger in terms of fundraising, the amount spent on advertising, and you know, everything else. So uh, it, it's very, very different. But all I was going to say is as a per personal side, for anyone who has kids, uh, when you go and vote, take your kids with you. Because if they get into that habit, um, you know, it, it, it's much more likely that as soon as they get old enough to vote, they'll actually want to go do it. One thing that a lot of politicians fail with is they're great at connecting with people during a campaign. That five weeks, they go out there, they shake hands, they beg, they borrow, they steal, they buy beer. <laughs> Not that my candidate ever did that, okay? And then they get elected, and you don't hear from them until the next election. And that's one of the big failures, right? And especially on social media accounts, and I hammered this in to, you know, Keith Martin, it took him a while, but he eventually got there, and he started connecting with his people on a weekly basis. He could be in Ottawa, he could be on an international trip, he could be back in the riding. But he was letting people know what was going on and having that conversation online. I think that is vital. That ties into what uh, Janai was saying, is that it takes time to build up a relationship. You can't do it over five weeks. You cannot make that trust connection. That a lot of the, the social media that was out there, that was being used by the leaders, by the other politicians, was ignored eventually because they eventually people who are savvy to it, especially the youth voter, realized I'm not talking to that person. I'm talking to his team member. I'm not sure 
you know, what percentage would be um, lost because of that? I mean, I think given the short amount of time, lots of people already had their opinions made about how they were going to vote, you know, for which um, party or which leader they were going to support. I think the issue here with um, college age youth, I mean, the youth that I'm most familiar, familiar with, given my work at UVic, is that I have to be honest, they're all stressed out taking finals. Mm -hmm. As much as some of them are interested in politics, um, the Keeners who are you know, involved with the Young Liberals, the Young NDP, the Green Party, um, et cetera, et cetera, they're gonna go out and vote. But others, I mean, they're walking around, it looks like they haven't bathed in four days, <laughs> yeah. they're muttering to themselves, yeah. they're just focused on their final exams, just getting home. Youth at Campbell <laughs> <laughs> Um, maybe. So I, I don't know if it's that they have these strong bullshit um, meters and they don't feel connected to the candidates. I think it was just terrible timing for college-age students. Yeah, I was going to say is if, if there were more politicians that were tweeting like Tony Clement and others, I think there'd be more of that engagement. But like I say, that's the exception right now rather than the rule. And we've all known for, um, you know, probably since politicians first gave speeches that someone was writing. Chapter one of uh, social media and politics best practices is due out in November 1995, available via Amazon. Uh, no, uh, honestly, that, that is a failure in setup. Um, best practices are basically you have a team account and a candidate account or just a team account, and you make it very clear who is posting on that, no matter what the platform is. Um, again, I would agree with Janai, five-week campaign. It's very hard for people to kind of change their mind once it's made up, and I don't think that bullshit meter changes that much over that time period. Because there was that stretch between July and election time that Falcon didn't tweet at all. Which goes back to my point that you're not connecting using the platform all the time, being consistent. Can we talk a little more about that and a little less about big P politics and how things might change in Canada, how... You mean grassroots? Grassroots will have more of an impact on the behavior of our governments over time. Well, I think looking at the Middle East is a perfect example with two years ago, the Twitter revolution, right? And so what we're seeing is that people have access to smartphones, um, are using them as part of their political arsenal, if you will. And so it's changing um, politics in the streets in a certain respect, and so we see more people engaging. Um, what we, thank you, what we um, see is that it's offset by the legacy um, media, so print, TV, and radio. And this is from the talk that you were on earlier, right, Teresa? Um, so there's a, a, a disjuncture, I think, between the two, because you have all these quasi-citizen journalists, right? who are tweeting from an event, sharing a photo of a dead 13-year-old, right? Um, and causing people to um, protest against a government. And it's no surprise that so many of these protests are taking place um, in places where the democracy rating is considerably lower than what we experience here. Yeah, I, I once again agree in, in the sense that um, you know these despotic regimes and the and the atrocious crimes they they commit. I mean, they it used to be done behind uh, a very uh, dark curtain of secrecy, and now those images are getting out. Um, people because people have cell phone cameras and they're able to do things. So you know the the woman whose name escapes me that was that was uh, killed uh, in Iran. Uh, uh, I'm trying to remember her name. And, that was on YouTube. Yeah, and it was so that was that, I mean that was all over YouTube. That was that uh, spurred a lot of uh, uh, a lot of people. There's a more recent case in Syria where a 13 year old uh, boy was um, castrated, uh, had been brutally tortured, and then murdered. And you know that caused many people to come out in the streets. So you know the crimes that these regimes have have done for decades. Um, now it's a thing where um, they're being in a sense out. There were movements out there, everything from the multiple sclerosis society to save the seals to, uh, you know, um, uh, what's happening with radiation coming from Japan. Thousands of people getting on these automated kind of survey lists or email uh, letter lists and sending them off to campaign to candidates. And we had to respond to that. We would often like push that up to our headquarters and say, 
well, we kind of have a policy, but it has to be more fleshed out. There has to be more detail. So in, in a lot of senses, grassroots movements, if they have a, uh, a momentum behind them, can affect a party or a politician to respond to that.